All right, here, welcome to uh, week four of our income tax class. We are going to be looking at uh, gross income today, but before we get started, I wanted to show you one update I had to the syllabus in case you do follow the homework part of the syllabus uh, pretty strictly and not necessarily what's in Blackboard. For week five, not this week, but next week when we would normally have our chapter three and chapter four tax return due, <clears throat> I've added one thing, and if you go into the week five and go into assignments and assessments, hopefully you'll be able to see what I've done a, uh, a little differently than what your chapter one and chapter two tax returns are like. For chapter three and chapter four, as I mentioned in last week's video, I believe, and I heard that some of the uh, video, the sound for some of you went away, but I'll try to... Uh, explain more what I'm, what I'm doing. I had I have two items for tax returns for next week in week five. One, the end of the chapter returns like you did for chapter one and two. Instead of submitting those files, you're going to go in and answer like you would our homework questions. So and I tell you which ones we're doing. I say it in the description there, chapter three, number two, who's Williams and at the end of the chapter, number four, tax return one, Carlisle. You'll do the tax return like you normally would in Tax Act in your, in your software. But then instead of submitting it, what you're going to do is answer these questions. So what is the um, amount on line seven of the 1040 all the way down to I have a couple multiple choice and a true and false answer concerning chapter four tax return. That um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. I'm trying this out new. And then... As before you do that one, as practice, the other tax return <clears throat> is the first one here, shoebox returns. And if you, when you read through this, you'll see that beginning on page 319, you have an example tax return to do. And then on the following pages, you have the W-2s and 1099 IMT all the different tax forms you need, the actual real tax forms, what they look like, instead of just the bare bones, what they give you at the end of the chapter. The, the good thing about these tax returns are is you, they give you checkpoints at the very end of each person's section on what your tax return refund should be and all the different amounts, like your gross income, your AGI, and so you can check yourself. And so for this, all, what I want you to do is actually submit your tax return file like you did in Chapter 1 and 2, where you actually upload instead of answering questions because they give you the answers. I just want to see that you did it. So I'll just open up your tax return file, look at it, and then you, if you did it and it looks like it's, you had the same answers as the book, then you get the full 20 points, a pretty easy 20 points, really, because you can check your work. So read through this. I try to give you a good explanation for each of them, and then the end of the chapter tax returns is where you fill in your final answers when doing the tax return. Again, that will be next week, week five, and we'll also do the similar, very same, for uh, week six and seven for the following two weeks. We'll have something similar with these shoebox returns. Notice on the shoebox returns, I want you to do all of chapter three for the first individual, uh, Mr. Chow, and then go to Chapter 4 as well and finish up Mr. Chow. It's a cumulative problem, and it actually continues on later. But I just want you to do the first uh, two chapters there, three, chapters 3 and 4, and then um, up, upload your file. And do the same then for the Ramirez. Don't upload Chapter 3 and then Chapter 4 separately for Chow. Upload just one document with Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 together. All right, let's get into this week's material. I'm opening up my Word document. <clears throat> I've made a few changes. If you happen to uh, save this file or printed it off before today, which is February 2nd, um, you may want to get them updated copy. There's not a lot of changes, just a few numbers here and there that I, that I had, I had updated yet from the 2013 tax year. I think I've got everything updated. The biggest thing in this chapter is, I think, on the first two pages of these notes, is basically remembering what 
what income is taxable, and then what are the exceptions to income being not taxed. Basically, it's, easy to re it's easier to remember what is not taxed because there's a finite amount of things that are not taxed, which the gen when the general rule is any income you receive is taxable income unless it's on that specified list of things that are not taxed. So uh, what I wanted to do is I went through and just came up with a bunch of different items that are taxable. Now, of course, this isn't the entire list by any means, but some common ones, some of the things I think you'll, you would run into if you're doing a typical return at least maybe once or twice a year, and some of these a lot more than that. Uh, one that you may, you, that's easy to remember that, and it's also easy to mix up with workman's comp is unemployment. So unemployment is when you're laid off from a job through no fault of your own, but you still receive money from the state, that is taxable. Whereas if you receive uh, workman's comp, which means you got hurt on the job, that money is not taxable. So there's a big difference between those two, and a lot of people get those mixed up or intertwined or think they're the same thing, maybe. but they're definitely not. Uh, retirement income, you put money away, it's not taxable when you put it away. Uh, as long as it's a normal, like a 401k, uh, but it is taxed when you bring it out. Hobby income, we're going to look a lot more at hobby income when we get after the midterm uh, in weeks 10 and 11. And we're going to do a whole series on hobby versus job income. I think that's a pretty interesting section. And I listed some other things. Um, this is one that we run into some on our tax returns, especially from the book. If somebody receives a refund from their state taxes the prior year, say they received their $250 refund, it is taxable only if that individual itemized the last year. If you didn't itemize, if you just did the regular standard deductions, then that refund that you received on your state return is not taxable. So it's only taxable if you itemized. Read through the rest of these. I think they're all important. Again, I'm going to keep these videos pretty short and concise. Now, let's look at a little bit more in detail these common non-taxable items. One of the biggest, probably the biggest two that I hear that people ask me a lot is gifts and inheritances, where these items are not taxable. They're taxable to the estate if it's an inheritance. The estate is taxed on it, but then when you receive it as the inheritor, you, uh, you're you not taxed on that. So that's a good thing. Any gifts that you receive from a parent or uh, any other family member or friend is not taxed as long as it's under 14000 It's not taxed to you or the, uh, the give over. If it's over 14000 it's still not taxable to you as the person receiving it. it the only thing is the give or has to file a gift and estate tax return for that year, and that, that goes into uh, later calculations to see if it, if it will be taxed or not. Um, note that this is 14000 per person, so if a husband and wife give a gift, it could be up to $28,000 because the husband gives 14000 the wife gives 14000 and if it's a husband and wife giving to another husband and wife, they could even do a double the double 28. They could give, uh, so that would be 56000 The husband and wife both give 28000 to the other couple's husband, and then the husband and wife give 28000 to the other couple's wife. So there's different ways of doing that 14000 to get around Scholarships for tuition and books. Note this is for tuition and books only. If you receive a refund and that refund is because of your Pell Grant, because maybe you had a Pell Grant and a 21st century scholarship and anything else that puts you, that gave you more money than was actually needed for your tuition and books that year, that amount is taxable. A lot of people don't understand that, especially students who come in for VITA. 
now that we have started doing tax returns this year. I'll have a student say they received $2,500 in Pell Grants and their tuition was only $2,000 with their books. Therefore, they received a $500 refund. That $500 refund, because it was free money, is taxable and does go on the tax return. So many people don't understand that um, until I explain it to them, and then a lot of them are upset. But I tell them it's free money. There's no need to be, they're like, well, so it hurt me on my tax return. And I tell them, well, yeah, I guess in a way it kind of hurts you, but still, you may be paying an extra $30 on that money, but you received 500 free. So you're paying 30 out of the 500 you received free. I don't think that's too bad of a deal. <clears throat> Welfare payments. Workers' comp, this is the big one that I told you, don't get mixed up with unemployment. Workers' comp, when you get hurt, not taxable. <clears throat> this is one where you can really earn a lot of money. Municipal state bonds, when you collect interest on those bonds, if you are wealthy enough and you can invest quite a bit of money, for example, I knew of a taxpayer who had $2 million in income for the year, and none of it was taxable. So basically what the scenario would have been is he invested $50 million in some state and local bonds that he maybe had from an inheritance, and then he gets a return even of as low as 5 7%. It could be even lower than that, but he still got somehow $2 million in and, and uh, income coming in through those interests, and since it was one of these municipal bonds, none of that $2 million was taxable, so he could live easily year to year now with um, tax-free money, all $2 million coming in and none of it going to tax, which is quite a nice um, ability if you have that. Child support. Child support is definitely different than alimony. Alimony is to pay for the spouse and their well-being to help them stay afloat. Child support is not taxable. It is to help pay for the kids. Qualified tuition program payments. If you get money out of a college fund that somebody set up for you, that's not taxable. <clears throat> and then I've mentioned just a few other things. Uh, damages for physical personal injury, which when you compare these two um, when you get paid back, basically, is what this first one is. You get paid to fix your car, or if you have physical injury, you get paid to fix your body. Those are, you don't get taxed on any of that money. But as, as, if we scroll back up, the punitive damages, damages that you receive over and beyond the amount that it causes you to get better or to fix your item, those are taxable as income, those punitive damages. Okay, let's, um, let's keep going down. Do read through a lot of these. Oh, one of the other ones, life insurance proceeds. Life insurance, when you receive the proceeds, they are not taxable. So if somebody has a, a life insurance out and then they die and you receive a, a nice sum of money, uh, that's all tax-free. So that's a really good thing. Oh, one thing I hear, too, is, uh, well, how do I record my kids' income? Because they're at a working age now, but yet I still claim them. They're in high school, maybe. What can we do with that? So this child earnings, generally it's best if the child files their own tax return because the child is going to be, in a lot of cases, in a lot lower tax bracket than you are as the adult who is making more money. So if they have a small income, say of uh, 2500 or or less, or even maybe more or less, but you're, they're going to be in that very low tax bracket where probably even none of it is taxable, and they're going to get it all back. But if you add it again to your income, where you're already in the 10, 15% bracket, then they're going to be, then that money's going to be taxed a little bit. So it's generally better if the kid um, does file their own tax return and then you as the 18-year-old uh, adult has to sign off on it. <clears throat> and you can see the signature items here. Um, 
the parents do have the option of claiming the income on the kids on their own return. Again, I don't recommend it. But here are the qualifications on when you can do it. Notice it's only if the child has interest in dividends. So if the child comes home with the W-2, they worked a little bit during the year, you can't add that income to your own return. And, and it wouldn't be very wise to do that anyway. But if the child does only have interest in dividends up to, as I show here, $10,000, you can add that to your own income and only file one return. Again, it's, a lot of times it's better if the kid goes ahead and does it because of that tax rate again. Child care providers, this is something that um, I, I found out a few years ago after doing a little bit of research on the item, and I thought, wow, this, is, this could easily come up. If you have somebody in your home that you employ kind of like a nanny and they come to your house and they stay most of the day while you're at work, if you pay them over $1,900 in a year, you're technically their employer and they're your employee, which means you have to treat them like an employee. We'll get into that later into the semester when we talk about having your own business and what you do with that, but you would have to basically start taking out payroll taxes and issuing them payroll checks, which I think is a little bit overdue. I don't I don't really like this is a, a tax law that I definitely disagree with. I think the nineteen hundred is way too low. If it was a higher amount I can understand. Uh, but paying somebody to come to your house, there's a good chance you're gonna pay them over nineteen hundred. It doesn't take very long to get up to that amount. And you would have to treat them as an employee. Basically, you'd have to go through a payroll because most individuals wouldn't know how to do payroll. And they would need to go through a small CPA firm or a company like EDP Payroll Services. You could also, I guess, buy QuickBooks and kind of teach yourself how to do it. Through, and we also go through in our, pay, in our payroll class, counting one of six. Um, a quick difference between the cash and the accrual method, most of you hopefully have taken Accounting 101. Therefore, you should have a, a basic idea between the difference of the cash and the accrual method. GAP in your Accounting 101 class definitely does require us to use the accrual method, which says we, max, we match revenue and expenses when they occur. So if we did a job, in uh, 2014, December 2014, but we weren't paid until February of 2015, we would still count the revenue in 2014 when we did the work. That's not the case for tax purposes. You only record the income when you receive the money because it would be unfair for you as the business to have to pay tax on income you don't even have yet. So that's the real quick difference between the cash method and the accrual method. Cash method, you only record income and expenses when they come in or when you pay them out. Accrual method, you record the expenses and revenue when they occur. So a company could easily have two sets of books, one for gap and one for tax, and they both be uh, accurate for their required purpose. We're going to talk about three different types of income in this class throughout. Most of them that we talk about will be of the active where you actually go out and earn it. The portfolio is more of your interest in dividends. So you've earned interest on your investments where you receive dividends from a company. And then passive, the biggest one we're going to look at is the real estate. If you own real estate, what I mean by that is rentals. If you rent out houses, uh, you have a house or two that you rent to your tenants and you collect money, that would be a, a type of passive income. And these, if you ever have um, losses, you don't offset each of them. So if you have a loss with one or the other, you have to offset them against each other, except there's a couple there's a couple of different rules with that, and we'll get into those, but typically you don't offset one with the other. You have to keep the three different types separate from each other. Tips, you can read through this, how to do tips. Um, I don't need to explain that, but definitely do read through some of the different things that could happen. Uh, interest and dividends, you file a Schedule B. We're going to talk about Schedule A in two weeks. The uh, 
Schedule B of the 1040, there's going to be different five different schedules that we're going to look at in this chat in this uh, semester. Schedule A, we're going to look at in two weeks with the itemized deductions. Schedule B is the first one we're going to hit now. Schedule C is when you have your own business. Schedule D is when you have stocks and you buy and sell generally stocks or you sold them and you have a gain or a loss. And then Schedule E is for those with rental income. So Schedule B, you have to fill out Schedule B if you made over $1,500 in either or interest or dividends. <coughs> Uh, you can go through this after-tax rate return, and what this is saying is even though you may get municipal bonds, they may offer them to you at a lower rate um, than what a typical market would be would bear at this time. Say the municipal bond was a 5%, but you go out and get a taxable bond, a regular bond at, say, 7%. Well, is it better to take the lower rate if, because you're not going to be taxed on that income? And you could go through this little scenario here and say, hmm, which one is better? And I gave you a couple options here. And it makes a difference, a big difference, on what tax bracket you're in. If you're already in a high tax bracket, meaning you make pretty good money, a lot of times that, that municipal bond is going to be your better bet. Because instead of paying 28 cents on every dollar you earn, you pay zero. When if you're in the small tax bracket, the very low tax bracket, then you're only paying 10 cents on the dollar. So that extra, that extra 18 cents starts to add up real fast when you are uh, making big money. And I showed you the comparison. Section 529 claim. Good and bad about this. The, the good is when the individual takes the money out to pay for college, none of the money including the interest that has been earned over time, is not taxed. So in a way, it's kind of like a Roth IRA. Somebody puts money away for you, and then when you take it out when you're 18 or 20 and you go on to school and to pay for your schooling, none of that money is taxed as long as it does go to your uh, schooling. And even it even counts for room and board. So that's something that's not a lot of times included when you're talking about schooling. The only bad thing about this qualified tuition plan, the 529, is the person putting the money away isn't allowed to deduct it. It's just like a Roth IRA, which we'll talk about come after the midterm in week nine. <coughs> Dividends. This is one of the items I changed here recently in the last, uh, I actually changed today. There are two types of dividends, ordinary and qualified dividends. However, for something to be qualified, it is first an ordinary dividend. Uh, maybe to help explain it, it would you could not have you can have a Toyota and you can have a Toyota Prius, but you can't have a Prius without it first being a Toyota. It's kind of how I explain it. So ordinary would be like the the major uh, make, and then the model would be if it's qualified or not. So you could have a Toyota and then have it be a qualified dividend, meaning it's a Toyota Prius, or if it could be just an ordinary. And ordinary dividends are taxed at their normal rate. Whatever your tor uh, normal income is, it would be taxed just like that. If you want, if you want to be in a qualified dividend, which I need to change this number just a bit, it should be 15%, 20% only. You can notice the rates here. If you're in the very low income tax bracket to the bottom two, any income you earn from interest or dividends, or not necessarily interest, but with dividends, if it's qualified, if it's a qualified dividend and meets these rules, you're not taxed any of them, which is a great benefit. If you're in one of the higher income uh, brackets, notice you're only taxed a portion of what you normally would have been taxed. So about half, somewhere around half, that's good. And then, again, it's about half if you're in the very highest tax bracket, 39.6%. You're going to be taxed at 20%, so about half of what you normally would have been taxed. So you definitely save money if your dividends are um, considered a qualified dividend. And that shows up 
on your tax form when you receive a dividend statement. Alimony rules, you can read through this, but there are different scenarios on when something is considered alimony and when it's considered a property transfer. If it's a property transfer, there is no gain or loss at the actual transfer date. So you don't have to report any gain or loss on your tax return. You just don't report anything. The only time you would report something is if you, as the spouse receiving the property, is if you turn around and then sell it and receive cash or some other form of, of income, then you would be taxed. And you would be taxed at whatever the basis minus what you received. So in my little example here, if we had a $20,000 property that's given to the spouse, however, the property has gone up since they originally bought it together as a married couple, but now they're separated. The, um, the giver's gain or loss would be zero. The giver had to give it to the spouse because of the divorce agreement. The receiver, again, records zero gain or loss, and they report it on their books as $20,000 basis. Now, that's just reporting it on their books. When they turn around and sell it at some point, say two years from now, and it's still worth $30,000, then they would take 30 minus 20 and have a $10,000 gain to report on their books. Prizes and awards, if you go to the prices right and you win something, the value, the fair market value of those items will be taxable to you. That's why a lot of people, you don't really see this, it's behind the scenes, but instead of taking a brand new Cadillac, most people, if that Cadillac was valued at $60,000, a lot of people who win those, maybe in the 10 to 15% bracket, you'd have to have six to 9000 to pay for your free Cadillac because you're going to have to pay the taxes. So what they opt to do then is the price is right will allow them to um, do a cash value instead. Uh, it may not be the exact amount of this Cadillac, maybe a cut, but instead of say then, nope, okay, well, sure, the Cadillac will give you 50000 less the taxes that you would have owed, $9,000. So we'll give you 41000 for that new Cadillac that you won. One exception is if you get a gift for an employee achievement award. I talked about life insurance. I talked about the gift and inheritances, meals and lodging at work. The only time meals are not taxable is if you meet these criteria, these three here. It's for the uh, convenience of the employer, meaning they need you to work a shift and they need you to be available during lunch. It's right there on your premises and your, your shift would have been too short otherwise to have a normal lunch. If all those three are provided, then you would have a taxable Free meal, or uh, excuse me, a non-taxable value of your meal. You would have to include it. Social Security. I'll break the table down. I don't like it to be separate. <clears throat> All right. So, is your Social Security that you receive taxable? Now, so there's different types of Social Security. One is for mainly those who are retired. And then there's something called Social Security Disability, SSDI, insurance. Uh, those are not taxable income, and you won't receive any Social Security forms for, the, for that type of money. Some people are eligible for that and get it, and if you are, you know who you are. Other people who get Social Security will get a Social Security statement in the mail at, for tax season, and it'll say you earned uh, 18500 or that's how much was supposedly paid out to you, and then minus any amounts that were taken out for Medicare, if you wanted the Part B or Part D. Uh, also included or taken out of your check if you had any federal withholdings from your Social Security. As you'll see, a lot of Social Security isn't taxed. A big portion of Social Security is not taxable. What, what happens? is they start with your um, MAGI, your Modified Adjusted Gross Income. Okay, the, you look at that and you get your, you figure out what your, the first thing you do to get your Modified Adjusted Gross Income 
is you get your AGI, what your normal AGI is, not including Social Security, and then you add back a few things. Any tax exempt interest, so like that, that uh, municipal bond interest that we were talking about. If you, you still put that on your tax return, as hopefully you, uh, we haven't seen that yet, but you will see that as your, when you do your tax returns for next week, chapter three and chapter four. There is a spot on the 1040, line eight, line 8A is for your taxable ones, line 8B is for your non-taxable, so you do report non-taxable items on the 1040, and I'll, and you will, you'll want to put those in if you, when you come across them. But if you look at page 2-3, 8A is for your taxable benefits, 8B is for your non-taxable, and then line 9, you have your qualified and your uh, regular ordinary dividends, which you want to keep separate as well. <clears throat> All right, so once you've added back, and for most problems in the book, they're just going to go ahead and give you the MAGI. Some of them you'll have to figure it, but most of them that'll say, here is your modified adjusted gross income. If they give you that amount, then you just, then you don't have to worry about this. And then you start looking at this table, and this table is also in your book. But you'll find here, uh, if you, if your modified adjusted gross income doesn't exceed Either one of these, depending on your filing status, so 32,000 if you're married, 25 if you're not. If it doesn't exceed that, then none of your Social Security is taxed. If it's over this, 80% of your Social Security is taxed. If it's in between, then you have to do a little calculation, and that's what I'm going to show you here next. So again, your, your modified adjusted gross income is your normal AGI. And then notice what they do is they add into that AGI 50% of your Social Security. They add that as, as kind of fake income when they're just getting this one number here, this MAGI. They add back 50% of that, in my example, 18000 and some. So they would add 9000 to your what your previous AGI was. <clears throat> so here's my little formula that if your income falls in between these two, your modified adjusted gross income, the taxable amount of your Social Security is the lesser of 50% of your Social Security, so in my example, 9,000, or 50% of your MHEI minus your lower base, 90 percent of the time it's going to be case two. Your answer is going to be case two here. If it's over this, again, like I said, it will 95 percent of the time it'll be 85 percent of your benefits. 85 percent of the 18,000 that you got, so 15,500 or 15,000 is taxable out of the 18, which is still better than 18. So here is my little example just to, just to help us to see what, what's going on here. AGI, without Social Security, is 22000 We have some taxes at interest, and here's how much Social Security you received. First thing I ask is, what is your MAGI? What is the MAGI going to be? Take a couple seconds, pause the video, figure out what you get, and then, add it, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue on and see how you did Okay, for we'll take the beginning amount that they give us, 22. Remember, we add back in some tax exempt interest. So now we're at 26,000. And then we add back in half of the Social Security. So 26 plus 6 is 32,000. Our MAGI is 32,000. And I also show you this in the answer key that I have available for you. <clears throat> so, if we're single, 32,000 falls in between these two amounts. So we've got to do this calculation. I did them both, but again, 90% of the time it's going to be number two. 
and just to show you that. 50% of the benefits, 6,000, or 50% of the top AGI, the top, um, let's go back to my formula here so I word it for you, right? Your MAGI minus the lower base amount. So MAGI we calculated was 32,000 minus 25. 32 minus 25 is 7. Got that right here. 7,000, 50% of that, 3,500. So out of the uh, 12,000, in Social Security, all that would show up on the tax return as taxable would be $3,500. If we're married, 32000 notice that is the lower base. It doesn't exceed the lower base. So therefore, in that case, none of our Social Security would be taxable because it does not exceed the lower base number from married filing joint. It's exactly the same, but it doesn't exceed. Gambling, typically if you have to have income taken out from gambling, if you win enough, they'll take out 25% as a standard rule. And then I've given you some times when the establishment will have to take out the money. But no, even if they don't give you a W2G, if you win gambling of any type, it is taxable. So if you win bingo, if you win lottery tickets, even a dollar, technically you're supposed to report that on your tax return. Even if you go and return that dollar ticket and get a new ticket and then you lose, that's still you had a dollar income. Now what you did with that is up to you. Just because you reinvested it back into the lottery and lost doesn't take away that you won a dollar. That's how the tax rule works. So that would be considered miscellaneous income that goes on the, the very bottom line of the income on the front of 1040. And that would be uh, line 21 there, other income. If you hit any of these scenarios, then the establishment is required to give you um, a W-2G that shows that you've won money and how much. The only time that you can take a, de a deduction on the amount that you spent and lost in gambling is we'll see in two weeks when we do itemized deductions. So again, you cannot net them. If you win 500 and then lose 300 more after that or lost 300 before that, it doesn't matter. You have to put $500 down as income, 300 as a miscellaneous itemized deduction if you qualify even for itemized deductions. <clears throat> okay, the last thing that I wanted to hit before we look at a couple examples, uh, employee fringe benefits. Typically, fringe benefits are taxable by general rule, except if they fall into these um, exceptions, exclusions. Um, I wanted to look at this from the flexible spending account. That's a really good thing to do. If you can put money away into a flexible spending account, do it. Make sure you know the ins and outs first, but generally it does save you money. I definitely do it. We actually have a health savings account. Health savings account is even a little bit better than a flexible spending in that if you don't spend your money that you put away, you don't lose it. Flexible spending account, if you put 1000 away and you only use 800 for medical expenses, you lose that 200 It's, it's gone. It's, you don't get it back. Health savings account. Um, you get to keep your money, it rolls over. But with a health savings account, you have to be in a high deductible medical plan for that to, for you to be allowed. And then I show you how much you're allowed to put in, just for your knowledge, if you wanted to know. Your HR at your company would definitely be able to tell you this as well. A couple other things, if somebody, if your work pays up to 250 a month for your parking, that's a freebie. For, for you and for uh, tax purposes. Uh, if you do something, say you work for Southwest Airlines and you're allowed to take a trip with them as long as there's extra seats, 
if the airline didn't incur any substantial extra cost by allowing you to fly, that's a freebie, a great perk. Now notice it's only offered in the course of business where the employee works. So if you work for, um, I know some airlines also do other things besides just flying. They may do uh, ground transportation or something, I don't know. If you work in the ground transportation side of things and then you want to take a flight, that doesn't count. You, that would not be a, a tax-free benefit. It has to be in what you typically work, your ordinary, ordinary course of business. So if you're like a flight attendant, that would work. <clears throat> um, you can read through most of these. This one is if you take advantage of the fax, fax machine in your office because you need to fax a dependent day, daycare sheet or you need to fax something about to your realtor or whatever it may be, your attorney. It's such a small benefit that you receive that it's pointless for the IRS to try to keep track of all that. So as long as it's a small little thing every now and then, no taxes on that. And then the last item, tuition re reduction for college employees and the spouse. So my my spouse actually got one of her degrees from, from Ivy Tech, and she was able to go here for free since I, I work here, and none of that was taxable uh, as, as a free education when it typically would have been if not for this cutout rule. Okay, the last... I sure hope that was showing up. Okay, the last thing that I want to do is look at our answers. See if there was anything I wanted to discuss in more detail. Um, you can go through these. I think these could be self-explanatory. I don't want to take up very much more time. So with that, I will uh, we'll cut off the lecture here. We'll join in next week when we talk about deductions and also the brand new thing that's just out this year called the um, Affordable Care Act, also known as the Obamacare, and give you some scenarios on what, what, what we've already seen this year and uh, some tax situations that have come up and how that's all going to play out. So I think next week could be, uh, would be kind of interesting as well when we talk about the Affordable Care Act. And we will cut it off at that. Only thing due this week is the uh, Chapter 3 um, chapter three homework and the discussion board on that.